Uh, yeah, now oh, it's just scrolling up. No, it is. It's a volume thing, so it should be live. I've got an end broadcast button going. Yeah, now it's just scrolling up. Oh, you have up. to end no, it now? Okay, so it's, it should be live. I'm just waiting for this to come on. It's coming through on my screen on that page. It's a volume thing, so it should be live. Okay. Okay, I can see you guys now. Perfect. That's cool. I'm trying to choose the kitchen or outside, so and I might need a battery pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. Second day in a row, Sam. Okay, I see you guys. All right. Oh, that's no good with the snow in the background, eh? That's not going to work. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get off the phone and just watch you guys talk. All right. Sounds good. You good to go, Brent? Just, yeah, yeah, good to go. Just getting some juice here. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Before it happens. Are you on a desktop or a laptop? Uh, I've got the laptop laptop hooked up to a, a second screen. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah, Sounds it's all good. Plugged in. All right. Good stuff. All right, we made it. <laughs> <laughs> we made it. Um, yeah. Sorry about uh, that. No, that's all right. That's all good. I was just wanted to um, maybe run through a couple of things that you wanted to um, to talk about. Like, so it'll be pretty much all triathletes, I think, that'll be on the or that'll, that'll listen to the podcast and listen to the hangout. Okay. So maybe maybe if we cover, I don't know, something like five to seven points or five to seven tips that you know, that you could give them that would really sort of help them take their running, you know, take their 5k or their 10k time down a bit so uh, it's a mix of, mixture of sort of sprint distance up to Ironman competitors so you know I guess just you know general run tips that you that you'd um, usually tell a group of triathletes oh, okay perfect perfect yeah so it's always interesting one can just talk about you know why the triathletes struggle and why why some triathletes run better than others off the bike than when they all run together in a road race. So so we can definitely cover some of that because you know there's some neuromuscular stuff there. You want uh, you say the majority will be five and ten k, or will they be also uh, all of, uh, a lot of them be Ironman or half Ironman? Yeah, it'd be it'd be quite an even mixture. I'd say there's yeah there's people doing all different distances. So um, we could cover maybe um, maybe the differences in in training for the, the shorter stuff and the longer stuff. So maybe just uh, a, you know, a couple of the differences that, that people need to focus on there, whether it's, it's with technique um, or with training. Okay, okay. So um, I think... So I'm just... Sorry, you go. No, no, I just think with some of the stuff, um, with, with the longer stuff is, is uh, a thing that helps them, uh, might help them a lot is the fact that their form changes with fatigue and that they lose access to speed uh, as they fatigue, and then give them some tips on, uh, you know, how to proof, proof themselves against that fatigue. In other words, what kind of stuff can they do to do that? Because with the long course stuff, the differential is is the long course stuff. It's it's not their ability to run fast. It's the ability to maintain speed when when they have other limiters like heat or nutrition or hydration or or, or muscular fatigue. Whereas with the five and the ten k stuff. They actually short on strength. They they you know so they need uh, a, a more of a different training approach. So I definitely can cover some. So I think what I'll do is is I'll I'll spread the tips around and saying you know these are more important for the long course guys and these are more important for the short course guys. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm just making some notes here. So um, we'll cover running off the bike and what's the difference between yeah if you were just going a running race against some people. Um, or if you're coming off the bike, so what are some of the, the differences there, um, yep. and some of the things that you need to um, do in training to to compensate for it? Yep, um, yep. So yeah, what's the differences between going well in the in the longer events and the shorter events, um, and maybe some technique? So what are some sort of like your general uh, technique philosophies on on sort of? Know, body position and 
and lean and all that sort of stuff. I've seen you mentioned a few of your videos. Yeah. So the the first thing is is I I kind of recommend that the technique for the longer stuff is is higher higher stride rate is what they should aim for, you know, and and stay a little bit more compact and closer to the ground. So in other words, uh, more more of a of a speed shuffle, uh, and then for the for the uh, for the shorter races that they have more of a power based approach, but both of them I'm trying to uh, differentiate. So the the lean the forward lean is all about connecting the chest to the pelvis, and then um, uh, for the longer course guys, most of them are going to be heel striking and how to use that, and they, that's more of a pivot run where they they actually lean forward a little bit more than than the midfoot guys uh, the, in the more power stuff. So in the in the shorter, more powerful stuff, leaning more forward, is it? No, no. Actually, the longer okay. stuff, you know, yeah, exactly. Oh, the, okay. heel, the, the heel strikers have more of a forward lean than the midfoot strikers do. But of course, you're going to get some midfoot strikers do the long stuff. But you know, once they get off the bike, they they might even be able to run a half marathon fresh off the bike midfoot. But then you'll see when they get off the bike and they're running a half Ironman or they're running an Ironman, they're going to actually be heel strikers. And so sometimes what happens with those guys that are midfoot strikers that go to long course racing is is they they not they they don't get themselves fatigued enough in training to train the way the race is going to force them to run. You know, right. where, okay. where, whereas on the short course, you know, they can maintain that strength, especially if they've uh, uh, you know very well conditioned on the bike and they and they time trialing within themselves, then they can still maybe run with that with that power gait. And it's a body okay, weight cool. thing. It's a body weight thing too. Is, is the bigger individuals have very little chance of of midfooting an Ironman run. So is a midfoot strike better than a heel strike? That's a, that, run yeah, that that'll be a real fun question because uh, uh, it's not better. <laughs> um, it's right. very it's very interesting because uh, it, it's much more about uh, about efficiency and about speed. So. One of the interesting studies in Ironman is is that almost all of the women except Rennie are shufflers, and uh, there's very few guys that can go sub 250 that aren't midfoot strikers. They kind of, uh, you know, they heel strike pivot guys, and they're very, very good in the heat and so on. But they go about 251, 252, 253, somewhere in there. But you know, it's not a hard and fast rule, but um, to look at it the popular way of the born to run, uh, you know that you know the whole Vibram approach and so on. That that heel striking is is actually wrong. Is 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 a bad way to go. It's actually what works for you, you know. And I've got I've got friends that have run two oh eight marathons that are heel strikers, <laughs> and have won the and have won the world championships. And I've got a guy, you know, you've got a guy like Haile Gabriel Selassie who ran who the first guy to run two oh four for the marathon. After he had run 206, saying that I have to change my foot strike, I cannot run midfoot like I ran 10,000 because I'm not going to be able to compete. And he changed his foot his foot strike to a more of a, a heel first foot strike. Jeez. Now, what is there? Is there drills or things that you use to develop the different types of techniques? Oh, absolutely. Um, but. The, the big thing is is not for a, a runner to try and assimilate a technique that they intellectually feel will work for them in a triathlon. It's much more what have they got and then optimizing what they've got. So if they heel strikers but they have like a two beat heel strike, in other words their heel is hitting the ground and then there's a slap sound or a bang sound as a secondary sound when they hit the ground, then then that's not a good heel strike. Um, but if they have a real rolling heel strike, they're landing on the outside of the heel. They're rolling through, you know, through the uh, the the outside of the arch, and then they're coming onto those middle toes, the second and the third toe. Then that's an effective heel strike, and they should work on that. So it's much right. better to to look at a to look at rating. You know, if their rating is slowing down during the course of the race, then you know, then they're not well habituated. And then more important than anything, whether they're heel striking or midfoot striking, is what is their shank angle? What is their shin angle? If their shin angle is nice and vertical coming in, all right, and they're pivoting over the top instead of coming in this way with their with their heel ahead of their knee or their midfoot ahead of their knee, then they're in good shape. So the Kenyans can land even this way, where they're coming in with, with the shin leaning forward like that. 
but it's all about the shin angle, whether it's the heel or whether it's the midfoot, it doesn't matter. Right, okay. And then, you know, midfoot strikers can be, I've seen this happen with a lot of the triathletes, midfoot strikers from the bike can become forefoot strikers. In other words, their soleus, the Achilles area gets so tight from the bike and the, and the development of the, of the lower posterior chain on, on the leg that they get up on their toes too much and then they don't put their heel down. And that leads to all sorts of troubles with their plantar fascia mm. as, well, as well as with the Achilles tendon. So that's, that's the range of motion thing. The tissue gets too short. All right. Um, and then I also, uh, a friend of mine mentioned that on another podcast you're talking about um, in like an Ironman, for example, uh, even the pros will walk in the run. They'll yeah, have yeah, like a, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Can we talk about that as well because I found that quite interesting. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm a big proponent of the Galloway walk-run method where he's taken you know thousands and thousands of runners through the marathon and uh, I, I really feel you know with the, with the heavier uh, Ironman athletes, the, the, the guys that are so very, very strong on the bike and even strong in the water, that they would probably run faster if they used a walk-run method. You know, you have guys running um, uh, faster than um, uh, you know, uh, faster than 2.30 with a walk-run method. And, and I think if the guys can overcome their ego and realize that their cardiac drip, that their heart rate won't go up so high, they'll metabolize uh, um, uh, their, their nutrition and their hydration better. Um, and, you know, it, it needn't be that dramatic, but it's a, it's a really, really good way to maintain pace for a longer period of time. You know, if somebody's already running 242, 243 off the bike, you know, obviously, I'm not going to tell them to walk around, but if somebody's going, you know, 305 and they've got a, you know, a lightning fast bike and a good swim, and they're really just having a hard time breaking through three, that might be one way that they can look at it. If you look at yeah, it, right. yeah. If you look at a guy like Gordo Byrne, he's gone 115 off the bike twice with a walk run method. You know. Mm. Jeez. You know, and I think a lot of people will take 115 off the bike in a half iron. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, is it? Um... Is that only for Ironman, or do they like the top? What about in, in just a marathon? Would people use the walk-on method, or is this just Ironman? You know, um, I would say that probably ninety-five percent of marathon runners, at least people that have never broken three hours in a marathon before, will definitely go faster with walk-run. Obviously, there's a couple of caveats, and you know, you have to look at their walk-run. Uh, their walk technique as well as their running technique and you all, you know if they if they really quick stepping shufflers and they have a, a really close to the ground high cadence run but the walk run's not going to help them as much as if you get a, a guy that's kind of a big guy or a, or a bigger girl and she's really really powerful and they have a, a low stride rate um, walk run will help them a lot and you know it's also very good for pacing it's so much easier once, as I said, once you, once you overcome the ego component, you just start off from the beginning with a walk run. You don't get as hot. The heart rate doesn't go up, and you can go so much, uh, so so much faster for for longer. You know, it, it mm. really really works very effectively. And about, uh, I saw in one of your videos you were talking about uh, a lot of your training should be at a very slow pace to build strength. Is that right? Um, you know, it's not so much. Absolutely right. It's not so much that the training needs to be at a slow pace, it's more that the training must be at an intensity, and some people can run faster, you know, but must be at a very low intensity uh, relative to your VO2 max. So, in other words, if you're trying to learn fat burning, all right, and you're strong enough to go for a 45 minute or a night, uh, you know, 60 minute or 75 or 90 minute run a little faster without your peripherals failing. But but you know your your heart rate's a little high and you're working a little hard. Um, you start shifting the emphasis to more of a cardiovascular emphasis, and your benefits from in terms of preparing yourself for this longer uh, stuff are, are going to be limited. In other words, mm. from physical physiological standpoint, if you can aerobically run fast, then by all means run aerobically fast. But if you're trying to collect volume. And by going too fast, you're breaking down and are not able to collect volume. For example, when I worked with Bob Lindquist when she was world number one in the triathlon, we couldn't get her mileage up without the walk-run method. 
But when I slowed her down and added the walk-run method, in other words, made her run a lot slower and said, I don't care how far you run, but I need you to be on your legs for 90 minutes, then she was able to go uh, to, to run you know, 20, 25% more volume in a week than she could before. So sometimes hmm. what happens is we just run too fast, we don't recover, we gain from that workout itself, but we lose from having to, uh, a requirement for too much recovery time. You know, in, in, my work with, in my work with Peter Kerr, um, one of the things I said to his coaches at the time is, is that Peter needs a longer mesocycle. In other words, he can do what the other guys are doing in seven days, but he needs to do it in about ten days. And so in, 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 in Pete's mind, he's now doing less running, which he is doing, but for his, his type of physiology, he's just taking a slightly longer mesocycle, and he's doing... Uh, the same amount of mileage, but in, 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 in more days. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, and right. so, so that ties in very, very nicely with if you're trying to accumulate volume and, and your speed is making your peripherals fatigue and you can't come back and run again tomorrow, then that could be counterproductive. Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. It's very, um, a lot of this stuff is, and with my squad, I focused a lot on that sort of stuff with my swimming squad. Um, on keeping the heart rate down in the longer sets. So if we're doing 2100s in the pool, you know, keep it at, at that lower heart rate because it's just so uh, easy to want to go harder just yeah. because you want to work hard and training. But I keep saying to them, hold it back and, and get the real benefit from what we, we're doing here. So that's, um, yeah, a lot of this stuff crosses over, which is good. Yes, exactly. What happens when you, when you slow down is you, you, you take out this attachment that you have as an athlete to a certain RPE. So in other words, you feel, this is too easy, therefore I should be going faster. But it's, mm. actually, it's actually a question of mastery. Let the speed come up at the same intensity. So in other words, d don't go harder and work harder. Just do it at the same speed till it becomes easier and easier. Then the speed will organically increase at the same intensity and that's true mastery those are the guys that can mm. race in different conditions because they start to understand that you know and you see with the with the great runners as they you know Emma Snowsell was the same she did the same kind of training for for an you know about an eight year period before she won that medal it was just a question of some days were hard some days were easier um, at the same intensities and just learning that it's not you know hammer all the time some sessions you really want to achieve what you achieved six weeks ago, but you know two or three uh, RPE points lower. In other words, that's what mastery is. And and you're mm -hmm. right. When people when people can go on runs and they have enough space to concentrate on their form, to concentrate on their mental skills, to concentrate on their rhythm, to get a little spacey, and to just do the exercise for its intrinsic, almost uh, meditational value. That's when they become true masters of their own own physiology and, and are able to push exactly. in races. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I think, I'll, um, yeah, it'd be good if we can cover that. All right, uh, if you can make an, and make a note so that you can get yes. that out of me again, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to keep some gold for the actual uh, actual call. <laughs> precisely, precisely. <laughs> um, beautiful. And then, uh, what about some exercises that you do with your guys to to build their strength so that they can last for these races? Okay, so for for the uh, for the five and the ten k, uh, you know, triathlon is now ripe for doing what what the 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 track runners are doing, the ten k road runners are doing, and that is 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 getting themselves strong enough to be able to handle full on uh, endurance style plyometrics. In other words. Doing, doing the static hops, the static jumps, getting strong enough with the Olympic lifts so that they're stable enough in the back and the hips, the knees and the ankles and then the feet to be able to do the hops, the bounds, the hill springs, uh, that kind of more explosive type power stuff. Because with all the endurance training required in triathlon, those fast twitch fibers I feel get sublimated uh, and, and the athletes lose their explosiveness and uh, you know, especially in the ITU world, where you know, where the guys need 11 and 1200 watts to get out of corners on their bikes and stuff like that, they need to have conditioned their explosive ability uh, to do those kind of things. You know, the start of the swim is very explosive and, and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so, right. so you know, I, I like the approach to plyometrics, and then I also like things like 
you know, single legged squats and lunges and uh, and split jumps and and that kind of thing, which which they are all afraid of because it's so peripherally challenging. But I have you know sixty and sixty five year olds doing doing plyometrics and getting a lot of benefit out of it because actually they wow. needed they needed the most because they they they've got good endurance but they're losing strength you know mm. on a month, month by month basis so it works really well for that community and that's something I'd really like to cover in our talk is that whole concept of LT and ability to deal with the heat and ability to absorb uh, and 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 use carbohydrates and use lactate and use fat and all those kind of things are still um, bottlenecked if the athlete doesn't have the postural and structural integrity you know with his knees and his hips and his low back if they're not powerful there if they cannot maintain that knee stiffness and that hip stiffness for the duration of their event it doesn't matter how strong the engine is and so you know I always come to the swimming community mm -hmm. and say you guys have wonderful aerobic capacity you guys have wonderful mindsets and and, and you guys can spend hours and hours and hours staring at a black line. You guys know what it <laughs> takes. But you guys are building, in triathlon, you're building a, a V8 onto a toilet door. And when you go out <laughs> there, you're just going to destroy yourself, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, I've made a note there. That's a great point. Definitely. Um, now, what else? Um, in terms of uh, running off the bike, what's your... Um, What's your sort of recommendation with with brick set with brick sessions? So, um, you know, what do you get your runners yeah. to do, and what do you find they get the most benefit from? From the broadest, most subjective point is, is I almost want them to have a mindset that if they want to run X amount of time off the bike, let's say they're in a half Ironman and they want to run 90 minutes off the bike, all right. Then I'm I'm saying to them, you know, even though you've got what numbers and you've got percentages of lactate and stuff like that, I want to say to them, your mindset should be when you finish the bike ride, you should be able to go on the bike for another 90 minutes at that intensity. If you can't, mm. then you've kind of shot yourself in the foot. You can't expect your running to produce when you've actually tapped out on the bike. So the first, you know, the first real thing in my interview with with Peter Robertson, he said this to me twice. Robbo said to me, he's never raced well in a triathlon when he's been run fit. He's raced very well and won world championships when he's been bike fit. So that's the first thing. In order to run well, you must be, you must proof your run on the bike. You know? And then the second thing is, is if you do produce the kind of demands of competition bike ride with low stride rate, you're in trouble because you have to go into an event that is very, very different then. You know, if you're riding your bike at 75, 80, and then you have to bump it up to to you know 90 or 95 in the run, uh, it's very, very hard neuromuscularly for you to do that. So it's much, much better to get your your cycling stride rate neuromuscularly and power-wise up to something close to what you want to run at. Right. And then the third thing I think there that we want to talk about is is that. You have to race the run in a triathlon. 99.9% .9 of the community, they have to race it like an athlete. In other words, they have to be paying attention to themselves and their requirements. The minute they look up and pick a fight in the early stages of a triathlon run, they are dead. It's hmm. all it's all about pacing. So you know, they, and then when they get to the last five, ten percent of the race, then they can pick a fight, and then they can become a warrior. Hmm. But in the beginning, they've got to be an athlete for the majority of the run. And so you see that happening all the time. Like Gwen Jorgensen is a wonderful example of, of she gets off the bike. It doesn't matter if she's in the second pack. Uh, she has the fastest run of the day, and she starts off at the pace that she finishes off at, and she runs, you know, she runs mm -hmm. even. And the only way you can access your fastest run of the day is even. And there's a lot of emotional value coming out of transition and seeing somebody that you know and saying, well, I've got to stick to him for dear life, and it might pull a good run out of you. But it's still not physiologically the, the best way for you to run the fastest you can run. Mm. Yeah, good point. Um, all right, uh, and then into with your new with your program that you've got that you're making at the moment. So what are the what are some of the things that you're covering there? Well, I've got three main uh, categories, and those are my three main areas of expertise. The first one is is um, is working on running mechanics, and uh, you know the point that I try to make there is is that 
you want to get your mechanics to the best mechanics you could possibly have. In other words, how to recognize that. And that's broken up into a couple of pieces. One of them is range of motion, one of them is lack of strength, and then the other one is, is skill. Do you have skill limitations? The second part of the course is about run training. And, and what I'm going to emphasize there, because you know there's so many good books and, and good studies out there on each of the various components, but what I'm going to emphasize there is, is how can you find out what type of athlete you are and what type of training should you ideally be able to do and then use that magic period of training uh, to determine uh, what your limiters are. In other words, what should I do to strengthen myself to handle that kind of training and make that training match who you are as, a, as an individual. In other words, if you're a power type, you know, don't try and run 100k a week. If, if, you're, a, if you're an endurance type, don't try and do three quality sessions a week. It's just not, it's just not going to work for you, you know, so, and so that people can pay attention to themselves and, and instead of a fad or a current um, a current philosophy that's going around because some some star trains that way because that's their type. And then the mm. last part of the course will be the mental skills part. And again, to try and keep it kind of practical to, to help people sort through what's myth, what's been researched, what works, uh, what, are, what are coaches and athletes discovering that works out there versus, you know, what is science proven and what's has science not proven, and then what's just flat out, um, you know, uh, mythology that's been created inside of the sport but it doesn't really work. Mm, right. So that, so those will be the three three main areas of the of the course and then there's a little section of course on running sports essentials, you know, which is so that pe people can look at, you know, how flexible do I need to be? Where do I need to be flexible? How strong do I need to be? Where do I need to be strong? How do I assess myself? How do I warm myself up? How do I how do I activate things like that? Awesome. Sounds good. Um and I don't know if you, I don't know if we came through at the start when we were chatting, but um, I was saying to Sam before that, um, like with with this, um, like I, I don't want to make um, any commission or money off it. Like I'm happy to promote your stuff because I know it's good and that it will really help the guy, you know, my audience. So um, and that way I can sort of I can come at it with a, you know more credibility just to say that I recommend your stuff and um, I'm I'm going to go through it myself as well anyway. So. Um, yeah, I think that will that will help it as well. That that that's really kind of you, and I, I I I don't know if you heard me. I heard you say that at the beginning, and I really appreciate that. And I think that's a good way to gain what we want, which is to 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 help people have a better experience in the run. Uh, but at the Absolutely. same time, I I also want to offer if there's some somewhere you know very soon down the line some opportunity of reciprocity. Uh, where we, you know, where I can do the same thing for you to my community, that that would be great. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm I'm in the process of putting together something similar to what you're doing, actually. Just a, um, you know, something that's that covers everything you basically need to know in order to improve your swim. So um, when that's um, when that's available, then um, yeah, then I think that would be something that will really help the um, your community as well. So I'll um, I'll let you know when that's when that's happening. For sure, and I've seen some of your stuff on Facebook. It's really cool. I, I, li I like it. It pops really nicely. You know, the thing with yeah, the, sw <laughs> the, the swim has that. I don't know. There's something about the swim that is that is a much more uh, closed environment. You know, I call it sens sensory deprivation. But you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if you've ever seen Sheila Tayomino's book. It's uh, called The Suit. I think she changed the name now. Oh, I haven't seen it. No. Oh, okay. You know, she, she's that. Uh, she she won the world championships in Madrid, uh, in in the ITU, and she was an Olympian in Athens. She's gone to the Olympics as a swimmer and won a gold medal in a relay. And then she went twice as a triathlete, and then she went one as once as a modern heptathlete. But she wrote, she did a really nice little swimming book, and it's about how smaller people can swim really well because she's really small. And uh, the thing about the book that's so fantastic is is how incredible the visuals are. She's got a, you know, she just does this comparative stuff. This is what a poor swimmer does. This is what a good swimmer does. Is this swim speed secrets or is that someone else? Um, I don't know if that's, I know it was called that's... called a suit and then she changed it and her name is Sheila Tayomina. But anyway, I was thinking when I looked yeah, at your, right. when I looked at your videos and stuff is, is that it had that, that depth, that beautiful blue look to it and, and I thought it was a great <laughs> idea she'd have She'd have literally have somebody doing it wrong on one page, and then on the next page have it corrected, mm -hmm. and it was very striking. So, you know, I yeah, liked it, yeah. 
I'm just looking here. I have, yeah, I have actually read. The, yeah, it's called Swim Speed Secrets. I read that uh, oh, okay, the other good. month, and it's um, it is a great book. Like it's, it just explains it so well. So. Oh, um, good. I'm glad you think it's good because I, I wouldn't know. I just I know <laughs> Sheila well, and I thought she did a good job with the book. Yeah. Yeah, no, she did an excellent job and explains explains the catch in the pool, which is the most important part. She explains it so well, so it uh, it is a good book. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. Well, we'll um, now that we've got this working, I don't know if um, um, yeah, when uh, when we want to organise to do this when it fits your your schedule. Um, well, if, if we need, I think. Um, it's up to Sam in terms of how much marketing time he feels he needs, um, mm. but but you know now that we're up to speed and and you feel you can get your questions ready by tomorrow, then we can just do that. You know. Yeah. But, cool. Cool. But I. I, uh, I yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no worries. Sam, Sam, Sam can contact you. I, I, I think obviously if if if, it, if if we need a week or so just to get a hold of people and and just get the word out a little bit, that might be fun. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm kind of easy because you know you guys are 18 plus hours ahead, so it's always going to be in the evening anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I'll, I will speak to Sam. I mean, I'm I'm fine to go ahead tomorrow um, with our with our same time, but um, just depends whether that's enough time to get the word out. I mean, I think it will. I think that you know it, we get it out 24 hours beforehand. It's um it just gives that people you know people won't forget about it basically so um, yeah yeah that's also true with this age of instant gratification and Facebook yeah. people say oh tomorrow cool yeah then they'll remember it but if you say it's in a week's time then they could make a note of it and space it you know yeah yeah exactly and I mean oh. we'll we'll get um some people and we'll be recording it anyway so um you know if if it's not hugely attended I mean we'll get people joining for sure. Um, it's recorded anyway, and it's then it will go out to my my audience anyway. So it's perfect. Uh, no, I think may as well. Uh, yeah, let's let's plan for tomorrow at the same time. Okay, sounds perfect. Great. Um, all right, cool. Well, oh, actually, I was going to mention as well. So, um, do you know Wayne Goldsmith? Yes, I do know well. Yeah, I know Goldie well. Yeah, I um. So I've known him for a couple of years, and he um we've been talking about doing a swing product together, and he said, ah. Oh, Check out this site. Go to go to bobbymcgee.com. I want I want something similar to that. He's doing a really good job, and um, <laughs> and that's how I came across you actually. And then um, then I met Sam, and then he I found out he was um, helping you with your online stuff. So it's yeah, small world. It's amazing how it works. It is amazing, and you know I think that we have an ideal opportunity here because we've come into this marketplace from the right place. We didn't come in uh, from a technology basis where we wanted to make a lot of Tom. We came in, in here because we, we've we been doing this for a long time on on, yeah. in, on a grassroots level and now this has become an opportunity for us. That's why I'm a little bit off with the, with the technical stuff. But I, I, I think <laughs> that the integrity of what we're trying to do is is very high, you know, and, and we're coming at it from the right side. In other words, we haven't dived in like an infomercial with no <laughs> substance from the start and then trying to Make it all happen with bells and whistles. We're doing it the other way around. We we've got the stuff. We've anecdotally proven that it's working, and now we're just spreading it a little wider. So I, I think mm, uh, you know I think you, this th this opportunity to synergize you know well, works really well. Yeah, definitely, and I'm uh, yeah just really excited about about doing this sort of stuff because um, you know being able to provide this sort of information to people. Um, and being able to help them this way, you know, it all just, I think everyone's kind of lifted by that, you know, so you know, I'm helping sort of, you know, promote your stuff, but it's, um, you know, it's in a way that, um, you know, we can't feel bad about it, you know, say if I'm, if I was only promoting you because I wanted to make some money, you know, it's not, um, I don't think it's a, a good way to go about it, so it's, I think we're, um, we're definitely in a good um, time at the moment where this stuff's really starting to take hold all the online type of coaching and, and advice. I think so too. I, I, I think it, it makes, it, it raises the the sport to a different level. You know, in the past, mm. you know, there was always a lot of, you know, if, if you grew up in the era that I did, you know, where there was the, the Iron Curtain and there was the, the East Germans and the Russians and the, and the speculation about drugs and then the proof that there were drugs and stuff like that, 
uh, and then it was information dripping out and you didn't know if the, if the information was really true and we were all as coaches trying to mm -hmm. find out what was going on. But in this modern era now I think what's starting to happen is, is that the best athletes are actually starting to succeed because the information is available and mm -hmm. also pe yeah. people can start putting themselves on that, you know, how do I relate, you know, how, where, where am I in relation to Crowey, you know, Crowey produces so many watts and, and I produce so many watts and so you, you know, people, people feel more related, you know, I always felt that when you go mm -hmm. to the New York Marathon or the Boston Marathon, people that are running the race don't know who the champions are, but in triathlon, Everybody knows who Crowe is and who Marinda is and, and you know, who, who um, Andy Potts is. They, they all know those yeah. people because they feel part of the same family. But I, when I'm running in the Boston Marathon, I don't feel like a Kenyan. I don't feel part of the <laughs> – there's a disconnect, you know. And I think that's, yeah. that's, that's the beauty of the Internet because I think, uh, you know, if you watch that Tour de France with, with Fignon and, and, and Greg LeMond, where, where the commentators were saying the sport of triathlon has brought us the aero bars and has brought us this and brought us that. So, you know, we, we're a really young, exciting sport where we can start, you know, we are pioneers. We, you know, people are learning how to train on the internet and stuff like that. You know, it's it's mm. it's it's very exciting time. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing to think, like, I've been doing my weekly videos for a while and you know, every now and then I get an email from someone saying, look, I've dropped, I don't know, X amount of minutes from my Olympic distance swim and, um, and you get these emails from people you've never spoken to, you've never heard from, yet they've gone on to take your advice um, and improve from it. And it's just, um, it's just amazing that you can do that. Oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. I, I, yeah. you know, I work with a guy and then he goes home and he runs his lo local route that he's been running around his house for like seven years and he said, you know, I went out, I tried this thing that you gave me and I ran a PR straight away, you know, like. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's awesome. <laughs> it's very cool. Fantastic. Well, um, yeah, that all sounds good. And Sam, if you're still on, um, if you can just send me through what the, um, what the, like, uh, discount is with the guys who, who listen to the podcast and if there's like an end date to it as well, just so, um, just so I can mention that at the end of the call, that'd be Good, um, but yeah, I, I'll see you at eight thirty your time and one thirty my time. Uh, All right, about it sounds great. Cool. All right, thanks, Bobby. I'll uh, I'll talk to you soon. And re enjoy the rest of your day. I see some bottles in the back there. So, have you got little ones as well? No, I've got um, I've got uh, a puppy. So he's my little one. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I've got two little ones, so you might have heard them. I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, enjoy the rest so, of your day. Thanks, you too, Bobby. See you later. Okay. Bye.